strictly for technical questions and discussions relevant to sessions. Please refrain from using any unnecessary messages. So this is the agenda for today. At 11 a.m., we have Kubernetes 101 by Vivek Sridhar. At 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., we have CACD with GitHub Actions and Kubernetes by Karan, uh, which is another great session. So from 1 to 1 10 p.m., we have the game time where uh, we'll be uh, you know, going live with the quiz. The links are in the description below. So uh, uh, the quiz starts automatically and ends automatically at, uh, under the, uh, you know, at 1 p.m. and 1 10 p.m. respectively. So uh, uh, yeah, so, so that's that. And from 1 10 p.m. to 1 20 p.m., we have the winner's announcement for the quiz and the closing note. Uh, so this is the code of conduct for today's event. Uh, this event is dedicated to providing a friendly and welcoming experience to all genders, uh, regal, uh, regardless of gender, uh, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, disability, ethnicity, or religion. All participants are expected to display a positive community spirit by exercising and respect to all they attend. An unacceptable behavior of or harassment of event attendees in any form will not be accepted. So guys, like I mentioned, we have the quiz time uh, where the top three winners will be receiving rupees 500 each and it is from 1 to 1, 10 p.m. So we like stay back uh, and let's have a you know great session today. Also, we have some pretty great uh, learning resources uh, like for you all to uh, you know read and like, help you upskill in your open source journey. So which can be found in this link, which is also updated in our description below. So you can go through that and start on your open source journey as well. Uh, we are also live with, the, uh, with this one, the dev challenge. Uh, so the dev challenge uh, is, uh, is, is sponsored by Microsoft Azure, uh, where we have uh, crazy challenges for you to uptake. And, uh, and you could also win yourself an Azure Hero badge. So the links are in the description as always. So, you know, get started on that. A huge, uh, you know, shout out to our community partners, without whom uh, OSS days wouldn't uh, wouldn't have uh, wouldn't be the success it always was. So these are the community partners uh, we have. Also, a huge shout out to our learning and streaming partner at Jurika. Uh, uh, so, and a huge shout out to Microsoft Azure for sponsoring our event and without uh, whom this event wouldn't have been the success it, it is. Also guys, if you're loving the sessions, please make a tweet using OSS days and, you know, tag us at Confirm uh, in your social media posts so that we may amplify it. So let's get started. Uh, and without further ado, uh, let me introduce you uh, our first uh, our first session. So our first speaker will be Vivek uh, Sridhar from Microsoft. So Vivek, uh, <coughs> so Vivek was uh, so Vivek is a longtime friend of ours, and uh, <coughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him. So he'll be uh, doing a session on Kubernetes 101, uh, which will be a great session. So without further ado, let me just go ahead and add him to the stream. Hey, Akshay, am, hey, am, uh, am I live? Yeah, Vivek, you are live. Uh, so it's great to have you with us today for the second day of OSS days. Um, uh, as always, it's uh, you know great deal to have you here. So uh, if you could just go ahead and give a small introduction about yourself and the session you'll be uh, carrying out today. Yep. Hey, hey Akshay, uh, thank you for having me today. And uh, you know, I you know. I hope everyone is enjoying the OSS days, and uh, you know, the, I, I know that uh, it was an amazing first day, and there were very amazing sessions uh, from uh, very good community leaders. And uh, I'm happy to kickstart uh, day one today. Uh, sorry, day two today. Uh, this is um, is very 
very interesting topics um, and uh, i just wanted to give a, a you know glimpse of how kubernetes you know how you can get uh, started with kubernetes in fact and i um, you know it's it's kubernetes is easy uh, only if you know uh, how how to get uh, started with it and what is the learning path and how you should uh, start learning from the beginners level to the advanced level so uh, that's the glimpse of my session and i will be uh, touching upon some of the core concepts um and architecture and also we will see how to deploy an application um and my good friend karan will take it from there and uh, you know going to the advance uh, on how to deploy it in production kind of an area from a devops perspective uh, how to use a, how, how to do it from a ci cd perspective uh, using git uh, github actions uh that's the session introduction before i deep dive into the session um uh, just want to introduce myself i'm vivek i did a couple of uh, you know software development work and then um i was part of devops teams in various companies and i had my own startup uh then in helping the developers um, empower themselves and upskill themselves um that's where i am today uh so let us deep dive and before i you know even go in further with all the sessions and demos and other things uh i am assuming that person who is attending this session knows about containers uh and is aware of uh, containers and uh, you know is 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 already know how to build and run containers uh so everyone has this question right so what what does kubernetes do so imagine you have uh, you know 50 plus containers or 100 plus containers um and you are running it on different vms and uh you know there is production uh, servers running and there is an application there is a you know request coming into these uh, containers and you are act, you know you are uh, serving these uh, requests so it is very difficult to manage uh, the request to manage the uh infrastructure etc so uh, what does kubernetes do uh, the main thing is to orchestrate containers uh, this is the basic uh, thing about kubernetes and um uh, so you you might you might have 15 vms or 100 vms and other vms so um to manage these vms you need an abstraction layer uh, uh if the containers are running in these vms so kubernetes provides an abstraction layer for this and uh, there is uh, so but it's nothing but a hardware abstraction uh, it provides an interface for you to interact with your vms um and you actually define uh, or you actually declare what uh, what state you want in these uh, vms and how to access these vms and uh, how these vms uh, you know how these vms can be utilized in a in a in a way that it has to be utilized uh, not underutilized by me so uh, and also kubernetes is a it's a declarative tool so what i mean by declarative tool is that as a user you declare what you want you you actually tell what you want and uh, kubernetes figures it out uh, how to do it uh, you know it's not kind of a thing like you go and do step by step it is basically you are telling someone that hey this is what i want and it goes and make sure that uh, the user defined a uh, set of object models uh, are de are designed and deployed uh, into the uh, kubernetes uh, cluster so uh, given the introduction to kubernetes and you know, what it does and you know it's a container you know, orchestrator it is an abstractor for your hardware and uh, it's basically an engine where it makes sure that the user defined declarative statements and user desired uh, statements uh, user desired uh, you know uh, object models is uh, is uh, deployed into these uh, systems so i just want to give the uh, architecture overview of it um so how exactly this kubernetes work so it's very uh, similar to um, any model right master slave model client server model uh, so there is a master there are worker nodes and the master make sure uh, that it controls 
the execution and worker nodes is more from executing the each individual jobs individual task which has been assigned to it so uh, from a from a architecture perspective from the way it works perspective at the top you can see that you know there is something called as a kubernetes control so it is nothing but a client it is where you declare uh, an yaml file i'll show you how how exactly it looks uh, while doing a demo so basically you will you will define set of statements um, what you want the infrastructure to do uh, how do you want it and how 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 logically you want to you know uh, how to build that logical separations into these uh, in 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 these master slave uh, setup so you you are actually declaring it and handing it over to the master through a tool called uh, kubectl um, it's not, it's a client tool you are going to install that kubectl onto your laptop and uh, you declare the statements in a yaml file and you hand over that yaml file uh, to the api server or through a you know, kubectl command um, interface and uh, master what it does is it's taking that you know there are a couple of uh, different uh, tools you know you know services which is uh, there at the master that is control manager and the schedulers and the exits exit is nothing but a distributed uh, you know distributed database uh, key pair value database it, it's basically storing uh, all the information about the cluster so it is it is having the uh, complete information about the cluster where the where these um, uh, containers are running where these uh, uh, how many nodes worker nodes are there what is the state of state of these worker node uh, you know what is the load on these worker node all the information is available at the exit and uh, and the scheduler and the control manager works together uh, scheduler is more from uh, you know getting the job done so basically control manager takes in the uh, the yaml file which user has defined and and then it you know it, it tells the scheduler that hey this is the declaration from the user and how can we execute this and uh, scheduler takes in the task and the job given by the control manager and it creates a plan with the exit data which is there and then it's it's uh, it runs uh, via the API server, which runs the same thing on the uh, worker node. So what what it is doing is it is uh, you know how many replicas you want, where how many uh, where it has to run these pods. I'll going to introduce pods later, but pods is nothing but a group of containers or a container. Uh, so on which worker node I need to run these pods and how. Uh, how to manage these pods and other things. So, and control manager uh, is basically um, a very core, very important, and a very core of uh, communities. It's basically a, a place where you know uh, it actually maintains the network, the secure, and the um, you know the storage, uh, and and the and the, you know you can also define your own uh, definition for control manager. You can define your own. Uh, definitions control in 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 the controller declarative and then use it uh, with your uh, object models which is the yaml file which is the declarative statements which you have so via the api server everything is talking to each other and um, handing over the job to each other and it is planning the execution um, so the the handover of the job happens uh, on the worker node via kubelets. Uh, if you see here, there is a, on worker node, there is a kubelet. And the, the kubelet is a simple binary which is responsible for uh, making sure and running the uh, pods, which is the running the containers. Uh, it is also keeping the information about the worker node. It is also hand, you know, giving the information back to the master node. What is the state of the worker node, uh, etc. So there is so many, uh, so many information which has been transferred uh, between these master node and worker node so that it, it can maintain the state uh, of what a user has defined in his uh, declarative. Um, and, and at the worker node, it is very simple. It, there is a containers, container Docker is running and containers are running in, a, in an abstraction of pods. And uh, and then there is a kube proxy to access these uh, worker nodes via internet. Uh, it is basically a control 
um, you know, DNS and other things where uh, it allows which port to be accessed, uh, which not to be accessed, and how to be how to access and other stuff. So basically, uh, the whole architecture is uh, very simple to understand and very easy to do uh, if you understand each and every component what it exactly is doing. Um, so to to summarize, uh, you declare. Uh, you declare the YAML, you declare what you want and hand it over to master and API server takes in and hand it over to control manager. Control manager reads the YAML and give the uh, information to scheduler on how, you know, what is required by the user and scheduler checks the exit and plans uh, where it has to be scheduled and other things. And uh, through an API server, it goes and talks to the kubelets and kubelet uh, you know schedules those pods or creates those pods or uh, does uh, other activities uh, like deployments and replica sets which i'm going to give a overview later but this is what uh, you know at the at the high level this is how communities work and uh, coming to the next is so uh, this is where uh, very interesting which i just wanted to give is um, we are at the day one i'm just talking about uh, what uh, a community story you know it talks about so there is uh, something which was built by Wendon Burns. it's a, a learning path uh, from day z day one to day 50 how you can uh, learn communities and master communities from basics to um, advanced level and uh, so uh, you know i'm just picking things from uh, fifi goes to the zoo Right. So um, if you go back and, uh, you know, go through these uh, learning path, you can actually find um, you know, very good videos series by uh, Brendan Burns um, on Kubernetes basics. And he has given amazing uh, video series there with a lot of information on uh, how exactly to use ingress, how to use deployments, how to use um, you know how to use uh, the overall uh, deployment and overall communities, how it works, and everything as is is, uh, is available in those video series. And uh, go through go through this learning path, and you will be able to uh, understand. And, you know, it it also helps the advanced uh, uh, advanced people as well because there is a lot of things which is there in terms of best practices at the end, and uh, you know uh, how to do a multi uh, container uh, applications and building different kind of CI/CD pipelines as well, which Karan is going to also talk about. And uh, this is a link at the, at the bow to access this learning path. And each of these learning path uh, have the content available through that link itself. So go through that link, you will be able to uh, go through this end to end, and you can learn uh, communities in a better way. Okay, so. Uh, to just to give you a core concept, I was talking about pods. Pods are nothing but a simple uh, basic uh, unit of deployment in Kubernetes. So basically, it has uh, certain containers, um, or it could be a single container. It is the way user defines in his uh, in his object model, and namespaces is nothing but you have uh, different services. So say service A, service B, service C and through um you know through a kubernetes cluster you want to logically uh, maintain the difference between service a service b and service three and uh, and also the way the pods are running right so this pod belongs to namespace which which service this pod belongs to which service so if you want to build a logical uh, logical uh, structure or partition your cluster in in a way uh, where you can identify these uh, pods and these services and other things uh, that's where you will be using namespaces and there is something called as services which is nothing but a load balancer to access these pods um, so it's very good uh, explanation given by burned and burns in those video series which i talked about on services on how to use these services and i'm sure karan is going to talk about it as well in his talk um, i'm just picked this from the fifi uh, go to go to zoo and this is how it is the story um so if you go to that book and there is good story there and uh, through the story they are explaining about 
uh, different concepts about uh, Kubernetes, which is really nice. But I've just taken a couple of things uh, which will help you to understand this session and also the next session, which is there. So the replica sets are nothing but you can define uh, how many you know, identical pods you want to run in your uh, nodes, right? I mean, you are only telling I need 10 of you know, identical pods uh, to be run on uh, on the nodes which is there so the you you can declare it in the object model itself you can declare it in your uh, declarative statement when you give i'll show you where to declare it in, in the demo and uh, and when you de define it uh, the the scheduler uh, the on the exit using the exit the scheduler and controller make sure that these many replications of a pod is running on the worker nodes it doesn't mean that you are actually mentioning which worker node it has to run because uh, there is no point in doing that uh, this that means it will be an imperative not a declarative uh, tool right so declarative tool you are just telling you want this money in number of replications and it is the responsibility of the communities to make sure that these many number of replications are running on on different uh, nodes so the the most important thing about this is uh, if one of the pod goes down um, the uh, the kubectl and which in, will inform uh, the API server through, I mean, API server and through API server, it will inform the scheduler and control manager uh, that this uh, specific uh, you know, pod has gone down. And since the declaration makes, in declaration, you have mentioned that these many number of replications has to be run, uh, it will restart the, you know, restart the uh, replications. So this is this, this diagram actually talking about that one, if one pod one pod goes down there is one more pod getting created so this is uh, why community is so is so uh, so helpful because it is a self healing mechanism is is been set here right so uh, this is the replication set um, and there is something called as daemon sets uh, daemon sets are nothing but making sure uh, a pod runs on all the nodes uh, there are uh, cases there are uh, certain use cases where you want you want to make sure that a pod runs on each node but in replication set you're not actually defining it uh, the scheduler defines it it can be that in on the same node uh, it can have all of these pods uh, replications are running or on different nodes it is running or on only on two nodes it is running if you have 10 uh, nodes but in demon set it makes sure that each pod is running at least one pod is running on these different nodes okay so and 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 then example of that is as well i just want to show uh, i just picked it from uh, elastic uh, how elastic does you know metric beats uh, if you see the metric beats right uh, there is uh, you know there is only one metric beat uh, pod is running on all the different nodes of the kubernetes uh, clusters and this is actually getting the information about the node and sending it to Elastic. But basically, uh, this is installed, I mean, uh, deployed on, on each of these nodes. So you can, uh, you know, use daemon sets in these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of scenarios, right? Um, deployments are nothing but, uh, you know, this is one of the, uh, you know, one of the amazing workload uh, feature of uh, Kubernetes because it's nothing but you know how do you roll updates and how do you do the rollbacks and you know you know how you can uh, manage the uh, you know upgrade of your system so there you have there you are abstracting you know replica it is using replica replica sets at the bottom but uh, at the higher level it is called as deployments uh, it makes sure that you know you have version 1 set on four to five nodes and or on same node but when version two is coming it is actually killing each uh each of those uh, pods once the version two is loaded and works successfully and and even the version one it's not like it just you know you know just goes off uh, it's it's basically paused or it's it, it, there's a cooling off period so it cools off and then it dies so that is the life cycle of pod you know very nicely explained by bandhan in those videos go home and really 
uh, you know, get those videos done. I am sure um, that is something which is which is uh, very very interesting in terms of um, uh, you know how you can deploy these uh, deploy these pods. Okay, so. Um, given that, I just want to go into the demo because I don't want to waste time. So uh, I've already, you know, got myself a Kubernetes cluster on a Azure Kubernetes service. So on the Azure portal. So let me show you how to do that as well. Um, I just want to. Uh, this is the portal, and once you log in, um, you can see the portal. And I'll just go in and create a resource. Um, and then while I create a resource, there is something called as community service. And when you click on community service, there is, you know, you can open up the communities cluster uh, creation tab. So it's very simple. It's there is a, you know, uh, if you go and click here, portal menu, and you just click on create a resource and you'll be able to uh, create new services. These are favorites and a couple of things which you can make changes. Uh, if you don't have a group, you can create one and you can create one now. Uh, this is the resource group and you can give a name. Um, test cube and you can give a name and you can use whichever region you want to deploy this. I'm keeping it as central. And you can make changes to the node sizes. Uh, it's basically a size, and and also the uh, when I say node sizes, it's nothing but a work on nodes. Um, this is three, but you can make it as how much ever you want. Uh, I mean, I'm just giving the number which I want to do for the test. Uh, there is something called as node pool that even if you have uh, declared and you know, all for different kind of uh, workloads, uh, if there is a scale scenario and you are running out of your uh, nodes which is there and you want to add a couple of nodes you can do that and there is enable virtual nodes is there this is a little bit of uh you know you know in a burst scenarios and how to use it in a serverless uh container instance service uh that's something which uh, very interesting talk there you take a look at it and there is an authentication which is there uh, basically there are a couple of authentication methods and other things and there is network um, if you can use kubenet or uh, azure cni as well is available uh, which is part of the container network interface and uh, you, you can either uh, use the standard load balancing and uh, and there is http routing as well you can select all those uh, uh, required information for you to do the network within the power within the cluster and uh, external to the cluster as well and then there is uh, you know azure uh, container service you can integrate with uh, container registry service in fact so where you are going to store all your containers and use it um, and then you can uh, you know do a monitoring and and other things which is required and uh, and just create a new cluster so i've already created a new cluster and i just want to go through the what application i'm going to deploy uh, this is the object model which i was uh, talking about and um, um, you know this is nothing but a declarative statement written in yaml uh, for uh, you know deploying an application so this is a couple of uh, spec couple of things, couple of information which I'm telling to the uh, Kubernetes master that this is what and this is how I am looking at this uh, cluster to behave and this cluster to work. And here I mentioned the workload is it called as deployment. And this is where I'm telling how many replications I want. Um, I can even say five replications I want or 15 replications of uh, the same container I want. And there are a couple of uh, other uh, other uh, information, key pair value information is available for you labels and uh, other things, namespaces as well. Uh, this is the namespace and uh, you know, this is the image which I'm running. So a couple of, you know, information which you can provide which image you are running. And then there is resource information, utilization of resources and container ports and other things. So this is a kind, uh, it's a kind of a service uh, attached to it, uh, the accessibility of this. So basically uh, I'm opening up this uh, particular 
uh, way to access the uh, information which will be deployed. So this is how you can write an object model. So be, you are telling the Kubernetes master that I'm, I want this information. Uh, this is uh, this is the how I want the infrastructure to behave, and this is how I want to run it. And Kubernetes takes this information and uh, it just executes it. So let us go and deploy this. Um, I just want to show you. So I have already created a cluster. So so that you know we don't really have to wait for the cluster to be created. Um, and there is already cluster running. And there are a couple of things you can see here. You can uh, you know you can see you know that as how you come especially from a community specific there are namespaces workloads which is nothing but the deployment which i talked about and then there is namespaces uh which is more from uh you know how you can logically define divide uh, your Kubernetes uh, cluster into different uh, services and how you can use uh, services and ingress uh, you can take a look at this let me go ahead and deploy the code uh, before i deploy i'll just open the cli and let me do the cli create the storage so this is how you can do uh, there is a cloud shell which is already there in azure so click on the cloud shell and you can access the shell from the browser itself so let me oops okay it is getting created while it does let me copy the code Okay, so Cloud Shell, everything available, already installed, Docker, everything is already installed, Python installed. So it's pretty easy to use. And um, so literally, let me go and say, um, what was that? Azure S1 Oat dot YAML. Uh, so I'll just create that and then open that file to insert and i'm inserting did i insert it properly yep okay i'm saving that file so now it is available here but even before i do it i don't have an access to the cluster so to get the access to the cluster i need to run a CLI command of Azure to make sure that I get access to the cluster. This is a command. It is asking for the credentials uh, from the cloud shell itself. So I'm just running this after an authentication. So it is now available to me. And so what we can do is, is just go and see, can I get node? So you can see a couple of services which is there at the top as well just to give you so this is the two different uh, you know uh, node worker nodes i had created uh, as an example when i showed you right how to create it while uh, doing the uh, demo for the Kubernetes cluster creation in aks um, so i'll just go and apply this and i'll just apply so the what i'm trying to do here is I have declared um, I have declared the uh, state uh, what I'm looking at and I'm just telling the Kubernetes master that hey this is how I want my infrastructure to behave and this is a command to do it and through this specific uh, kubectl CLI interface I'm doing that and once I do that it deploys the uh, the containers and service and it opens the uh, service to access it and this is how 
uh, you can just tell the Kubernetes cluster and it gets deployed and see that as a developer or as a, or as a you know as a DevOps engineer, I just uh, need to tell in that I need to write the right set of YAML and tell Kubernetes, hey, go and manage my infrastructure, and your infrastructure is just available for you to uh, you know access it and and get your application running and it's easy for you to manage and it scales and it doesn't go down because if one of the replications dies it, it makes sure that replica sets create the another pod so it's basically a pod level uh, design so one pod dies the other pod comes up so that's how uh, this whole community is maintained self filling right so that is one um, so let us go and access this external IP and see that this application is up or not. So, so it's uh, these are these are commands. So this is just talking to the API server which I showed you, and getting the information from uh, the exit. Um, so all we did was we wrote a we wrote a YAML file, handed over to the master master internally gives it to control manager control manager takes it and tells you to you know tells the scheduler to plan the deployment or plan the uh, rollout of this particular desired state and scheduler plans it using exit and then it takes it and uh, uses kubelets in the worker nodes which we created uh, to make sure that it deploys these containers uh, through a, through a pod and uh, it is getting deployed and kube proxy is allowing us to access uh, this application uh, through an api address which we mentioned and through a service uh, through a service concept right so this is the application which uh, got deployed and basically you can tell me you're a cat person or a dog person uh, you can also access this ip and actually tell me uh, so i can you know this is how the application running at the communities level and you can reset it and other stuff. So uh, let me go back to my slide. So all the information I just provided is there in this specific um, this specific uh, PDF. This is a PDF. Uh, basically, you can download this PDF while going to this link and you, you'll get all the content it looks like this so um how you can you know learn from each one and it has linked to those uh, uh the specific uh, activities or specific learning path so it's day one and day two these are the video playlist uh is available and you can also access it from here uh, directly and there are core concepts which you can understand uh, how aks or it's not just aks it's basically from a community specific how it runs and executes and uh, there is uh you know you know training uh webinar series available and it's kind of getting complicated on different dates right um the more you read about it on different days uh, you will go into the uh, understanding of becoming an advanced communities uh, user right so you will understand how to build microservice applications uh, distributed system book is there a uh, wonderful book uh, to understand how to build a distributed system and manage it and then there are a couple of uh, other uh, details here uh, this is a resource which i just wanted to give you so that you can uh, go ahead and learn stuff and get started with uh, communities and uh, that's the uh that's what i wanted um yeah, is it? okay so this this is the link to it okay so that's one thing and thank you and any questions um i can take it Okay. Um, thank you for the great session, Vivek. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the awesome session. Uh, so um, I'm really sure a lot of people were uh, interacting in our live chat and a lot of people had, uh, you know, like a few questions. So let me just go through the questions and display some on your screen so that uh, you can answer them. Yep. 
Okay. So um, I'm displaying question one here. Does container runtime runtime other than Docker like a kitty pod man impact the performance of Kubernetes? No, not really. Um, I don't think so. Uh, because any all these runtimes have uh, you know similar kind of performance, um, but you know uh, in a given a system, given a time, given different uh, possibilities, uh, we need to check that. I mean, I'm pretty sure uh, they are all the same. Okay, so uh, uh, like we have one more question, Vivek. What is the best way to deploy case on server running on premises? So it's the similar fashion. Um, there are uh, so CNCF tools are built on um, either it is on premises or uh, on uh, on cloud. You can use a similar fashion, and uh, there are a couple of tools. Um, Karan is going to talk about it as well on how to deploy case. Uh, from a CICD perspective and from a production perspective, uh, definitely it, 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 it is almost the same, right? And it doesn't change because at the end of the day, you're using containers. Um, containers uh, will behave the same way the way it is built, right? So either it is in cloud or it's in, it's in the on-prem. All right, so uh, we'll take our last question. Uh... Okay, what is the maximum time that a pod spins up once a pod is dead? So it should happen immediately. You know, it takes uh, seconds to come up because these are uh, already running hot containers. Uh, it's in. It's not a. It's not a cold container. It's a hot container. So, you, if you are familiar with the container, um, container. Uh, you know, contain what do you call that? Container building and other things. Um, I think this this is pretty much the same. It should take it within seconds. It should come up. All right. So do we have? Uh, so would you like to answer uh, like a few more questions? So what I'll do is I'll go into these uh, questions which is there. I saw that there is yeah, sure. lot of many questions which is there. So I'll go yes. back and answer a couple of them. Awesome, Vivek. So you can just hop into our YouTube live stream and uh, answer the questions there as well. So guys, sure. Vivek will be answering Thank all you. the questions in chat. Uh, so it was great having you here, Vivek. So we hope to have you here for our future sessions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, Vivek, you have a great day. Bye. bye. All right, guys. So that was Vivek. Uh, so next up, we have uh, another session. Uh, so let me just quickly go ahead and give you a small sneak peek of who the speaker is going to be. Karan. Hi, Akshay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, Karan, you're you're really clear. So how are you? Doing good. Uh, thanks for having me out here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you uh, like here as well. Uh, and it was a pleasure having you last time as well. Uh, so so Karan, uh, like, could you you know go ahead and, and give our audience a quick introduction who you are, uh, like what you do, and what your session is going to be about? Right, sure. Um, actually, can you just uh, bring my screen also uh, as well? Sure. Yeah, sure, Karan. Yeah, sure. I've added your screen and I'm removing myself from the stream. Great. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, for those of you who might be tuning in from outside of India, good afternoon, evening uh, as well. So uh, I'm Karan, and um, you know I manage developer relations for GitHub uh, in India. And uh, before you know, I dive a little more into uh, what I do. Uh, I want to give a 
quick sneak peek on the session that I'll be doing, which will be CI CD with GitHub Actions and Kubernetes. Um, so in the previous session, you saw Vivek talk about Kubernetes and also the basics and how to get started with deployments, etc. And what I'll be doing in this session is I'll be taking it a step further to talk a little more about how you can actually set up continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, you know, using actions all right within GitHub uh, and along with Kubernetes as your target. So, so let's get started. Um, so a quick intro. Um, so I'm Karan and uh, I'm a lot into developer relations, communities, cloud DevOps and uh, open source. And uh, when I'm when I'm not doing any of these things, you can you can you can uh, see me reading a lot of books and then you know doing a little more of on screen off stage work and then you know learning more about it etc. So um, so that's a little bit about me. And um, uh, here at uh, GitHub, uh, I work on helping all of you uh, developers grow uh, you know and contribute back to the open source ecosystem uh, and also you know help all of you in the journey towards open source helping make the software for all of us uh, really very better um, so that's one of the things that i do um, so all right so let's let's get uh, you know started then and uh, firstly uh, for those of you uh, who might not be aware of you know what is ci cd i want to give a very quick overview now, I think it's a good time, uh, you know, for me to call out that this session assumes that you have some basic knowledge of what is CI CD, uh, because I won't be covering in depth on it. It's it's really a you know a huge area and a lot of nuances for you. Uh, but of course, like most of the other concepts when it comes to development and DevOps, practicing is the best. So I won't be I won't be killing you with any of uh, a lot of the presentation, uh, but there will be a demo where I'll be showing most of you. So, so before before getting started, like how I said, um, so what, what exactly is uh, CI and CD, right? So in short, continuous integration, continuous delivery, but I know that's not what you were looking for. So, uh, so think about, think about the use case uh, or a scenario, for example, what Vivek had shown in the previous session, right? So you have uh, an application that you want to deploy on Kubernetes or pretty much anywhere that you want. And if you're working in a large team or even a small team for that matter, five members, 10 members, um, or even hundred members, thousands of uh, developers, etc., One of the challenges that you'll start facing is how do you manage all of this development and the deployment and the testing, the monitoring, the observability, the logging, and all of those things, right? So it won't be as easy for you to, uh, you know, just go on your machine, connect to a Kubernetes cluster, and uh, say, I'm going to deploy this. It's great for testing. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong in that. But when you're starting to use it on production applications, having a CI CD pipeline would be really, really useful. Now, uh, like how I said, giving a very quick overview of how this all works is say you have some code, you know, uh, an application. And for this sake, I'm just going to refer back to the application that we make sure you have, you say, a voting application, right? And if there are multiple people who are working on that, all of them might be committing their code to a central repository, say, on GitHub. Yeah. And there will be other dependencies as well that it might have. If you're using, say, something like Python uh, and you're building on top of Django or Flask, you need to collect those dependencies. If there are other front-end frameworks that you're using, uh, you need to collect the distribution uh, version of that, and you need to bring together all the related code. Yeah, So your own code for the application, as well as related code or dependencies. You know, it need not always be a dependency. It could be related in another way as well. Yeah, So you bring together that. And what you do in the continuous integration pipeline, largely, is you build all of that together. Right. So basically, you bring together all of your source code, you bring together your related code, etc., and make sure that your application is in a state where it is almost ready to be working and deployed. Yeah. So, but before that, you have to ensure that it is of a high quality and works as expected. So that's where testing 
comes in you know things like your unit test integration tests or whatever other tests that you would want to do for your application right so once your application is built you would ideally want to test it and the ideal way to do it again is to automate most of it so most probably your developers might be writing unit tests uh, and integration tests etc using a testing framework so if say for example you're using a python then probably you might be using the unit test uh framework or if you're using java then maybe j unit or whatever is the testing framework so you write that code for the testing and then you set it up in such a manner that all of these tests can happen in an automated manner so that is what your ci pipeline takes care of where once there is a certain commit and related code ready for your build uh the ci pipeline does the build and then also runs all of the tests to ensure that your application is now in a reasonably usable state that is uh, it's built is working fine all the tests have passed yeah so the cd pipeline is what would be after that uh, so there are different schools of thought uh, when it comes to cd uh, a few of them prefer to have it as continuous delivery few of them want to have it as continuous deployment now there is no right or wrong it all depends on how you want to manage it and how your team is comfortable for your use case so in a cd pipeline what happens is if you're talking of containers the output of a ci pipeline must most probably might be a container image yeah along with some of the other configuration yeah maybe like kubernetes yaml files yeah so in a cd pipeline a delivery or a deployment uh what you would ideally do is you would deploy these containers or a kubernetes manifest into different environments say for example you might have first is review yeah it might not be an environment but probably just a manual review yeah and then after that uh, probably you can set it up in such a way that there is a manual deployment or even an automated deployment to a staging environment wherein you're actually running your application on a staging environment which is very close to your production environment but is not housing production data and is not being used by users externally so you can test out how your application works in staging uh and then after that you can either set up a uh, manual deployment uh, or even an automated deployment into your production environment yeah so that's a very high level very very high level overview of what this pipeline uh you know would look like and uh, i'll be showing you a demo of this itself on how you can use github uh, along with kubernetes for a sample application so before uh moving into that uh one of the things that i wanted to touch upon adding on top of what vivek mentioned previously is the advantages of using kubernetes yeah so when you start using kubernetes for your orchestration yeah you have things like service discovery and load balancing uh taken care of or you can manage it yeah so when i say service discovery uh it could be things like if you are using a microservices pattern you know, wherein your application consists of multiple individual services that work together yeah uh when you have a lot of services the discovery of these and ensuring that the services are talking to each other um, becomes important uh, and even load balancing across the multiple services kubernetes can help you with that similarly with storage orchestration now if you have two or three vms or nodes uh, on top of which you're running kubernetes yeah managing the storage will become very important because you just cannot say that okay you know i have one vm and i'm going to store all my data just within that vm what if that vm goes down or what if your application pods gets moved over to a different vm or to a different cluster altogether as well yeah so uh, you can use kubernetes to configure the storage orchestration however that you want and automated rollouts and rollbacks um like how in the previous session vivek mentioned how you can use deployments uh to do automated rollout and rollback uh that is something that kubernetes helps you with and one of the most important things and this is what comes to mind when uh people talk about container orchestration is automated bin packing yeah so think of it almost as your resource allocation where uh if you have say two nodes or three nodes and you have multiple containers uh which needs to be deployed 
and each has a different resource requirement one of them needs a really high ram one of them needs a really high cpu one of them needs a lot of network throughput one of them needs a lot of disk io etc how do you manage how do you provision how do you decide uh, which container to be deployed in which node and to ensure that it is optimized as well so that's where uh, an orchestration tool like kubernetes comes in which helps you with that automated bin packing and also self healing uh, you know where uh, you can use concepts like your replica sets deployments etc to ensure that you have your availability taken care of uh, and also when a pod comes down or you know a deployment uh, etc is not available uh, you can add in necessary resources or checks to ensure that the state of the cluster heals by itself rather than your manual intervention and of course one of the more important thing is secret and configuration management you would have a lot of your secrets like api tokens or database passwords uh, you know and this would be very different for your staging environment your production environment your development environment etc you have to manage all of these to ensure that uh, you know the production secrets are not accessible by everyone or the configuration uh say for example the database url for each of the environment differs from environment to environment right so there are all of these things that you really have to orchestrate when you are managing multiple containers and that's where something like kubernetes uh you know comes in and helps you provide so so before moving on i want to give you a quick overview of what is github actions and how you can use that to orchestrate your ci cd pipeline using kubernetes so uh, i'm not sure how many of you might have already heard of github actions or even used it um, so i'm going to assume that you probably just are aware of what is ci cd but not what is github actions so in simple words github actions is a world class ci cd tool um, which is fully integrated with github and it can respond to any github event for example you know you can trigger your pipeline right so pipelines uh, usually uh, when it comes to ci cd are triggered by certain events so say for example you know the event could be timing uh, run this pipeline every day every other week or every month or it could be triggered based on releases based on pull requests etc right so um, so it's github actions can respond to any github events like what i mentioned before and there are thousands and thousands of community powered workflows as well written by developers like all of you uh, using which you can make your automation workflows and even your pipelines a lot more efficient and the best part is that you can use github actions for any platform using any language on any cloud so there are more other advanced concepts as well and advanced capabilities that you would have probably seen uh, in most of the ci cd tools uh, example being matrix builds yeah so a scenario wherein say you are uh, having a node js application and uh, you want to ensure that your application is tested with different minor versions of node js yeah so you would have to run certain repeatable tasks for every version of node js yeah so that's where things like matrix builds will really help you define a matrix of how you want all of this to run and there are also streaming and searchable and linkable logs uh, so that you can share this with your teammates etc uh, if there is something that's gone wrong in a certain place of your workflow there's a built in secret store as well which i'm going to show you a demo of it's very easy to write and easy to share it's all yaml you know so if you think about it uh kubernetes manifest files are all yaml and github action files are also all about yaml so let's let's deep dive into what some of these workflows are going to look like and you know uh how you can actually compose your pipeline uh using actions uh, and then i'm going to show you a demo of this itself so uh so an example is that uh one of the things i mentioned is github actions is one of the world class ci cd tool but you don't have to use it just for ci cd you know that's the beauty of github actions because you can set up any workflows you know it could be things like responding to pull requests responding to comments opening issues closing issues adding labels you know you can automate all of these workflows as well um 
and you can again use the millions of open source libraries to create your own actions and you can write your own actions in javascript or you know even write a container action that is a slightly out of the scope of this session because we are focusing more on ci cd but it is possible if you don't find an action that's already there or doesn't fit your use case you can go and write one of yours as well so like how i mentioned there are live logs uh, on the right you can see um, you know there is a workflow which uh, runs and you have logs with line numbers that you can link out as well and they're very neatly formatted you know to for readability so you can even set up checks you know for example in this case if when someone is uh, you know uh, created a pull request you can even set up checks saying that okay you know for pull requests all of these checks have to pass and only then uh, you will have the ability to merge this pull request yeah so uh, this is used by a whole lot of developers teams and uh, open source applications that you will see uh, you know they have for example mandatory checks like uh, tests have to pass or build has to pass and you know sometimes even optional tests like you know there has to be linting uh, that has to get passed etc so it really helps make things easier for you so let's take a look at you know what a typical you know uh, workflow uh, would look like uh, on actions for ci cd pipeline so there are multiple components over here so first thing that you can see is it's all yaml yeah so um, so all of these actions live in independent repositories yeah so when i say actions it means uh, a certain packaging of uh tasks yeah so and you can see where um uh, there is number one uh cursor uh these are all written in javascript using node 12 there's a toolkit as well like how i mentioned or in two you can use a docker file as well to to run these actions so workflows are the main concept so so workflows are you know kind of like the glue which bring together all the existing actions so if you were to look at the hierarchy for your pipeline there is a workflow or even multiple workflows and workflows have independent actions they're composed of actions yeah so and each workflow listens for particular triggers like one in what you can see there is a push yeah so that means every time someone pushes to the repository the workflow will get triggered and the pipeline whatever you have written after that will run um you can use things like uh shell scripts as well you can run shell scripts for your workflows um like how you can see where there is an arrow of two that's pointing it's running just a remove command you know of a yaml file um or you can use pre existing actions as well where you can see in uh, three where it's using a pre existing uh community built action yeah and all of these actions or all of these workflows you know run in virtual machines uh, which can be linux windows or even mac now the best part is you don't have to manage all of these virtual machines yeah you can if you want to uh, i'll come to that later but all of this is managed on githubs and for you so you don't have to worry about spinning up the vm spinning down the vm and all of those uh associated nuances that comes with managing the vms uh but i'm telling you this because this is how it runs in the back end and uh you have to define which virtual machine you want to run these builds on top of so the stuff to keep in mind regarding workflows is events kick off the workflow um and jobs run each in their own virtual machine so a workflow file can have multiple jobs yeah um and each job runs in their own vm and it runs all in parallel unless you specify other ways and in a job is where you specify which vm you want this job to run on um and there are steps again which run in the same virtual machine so you have a workflow you have a job and then you have steps um and all of them share the same file system and then you have the logs you can even share the artifacts within um you know within the workflows and multiple workflow runs as well So uh, here is an example of what a basic Java plus Maven CI workflow would look like. So just look at the structure. You can see that it's a single job uh, with the name called build, um, and it has five steps. You know the five dashes, which is your uh, you know YAML list syntax. Um, 
So the first one, and you can see this directly runs on Ubuntu. You're mentioning that run on Ubuntu hyphen latest, whatever is the uh, latest, um, you know, release of Ubuntu, uh, the stable one, uh, the latest tag to be specific is uh, what will be used to spin up this. Um, you can see checkout is separate. So uh, what happens is that when this, when this workflow gets triggered, the first thing that you would want is to bring in your source code because you're doing a lot of your building and testing based on your source code itself, right? So, uh, so you check out those files, that's a separate action. And then after that, there are setup actions as well, you know? So think of setup actions as some of those basic things that you would want to do uh, before you do anything else. As an example, uh, you know, here in setup Java, you would want to have your JDK set up. Um, or, you know, if you are running a setup for your Node application, you would want to have Node and NPM installed and set up and ready. So remember, this will be, uh, you know, just a plain vanilla, uh, say, Ubuntu machine. You know, so whatever dependencies that you have, you need to install that yourself uh, within the workflow. But it's usually simple using setup actions. And then you can see Maven is run by a shell, uh, you know, using the MVN command. And then there is also, um, you know, an artifact which can be uploaded uh, separately. So um, when it comes to triggers, basically what triggers your CI CD pipeline? Uh, there are multiple triggers. Um, so there is a complete documentation for the various types of triggers. I want to go into that, but you can see you can listen for multiple events, listen for a push and a pull request and a uh, you know, comment or a comment or an issue you can listen for all of them together. You can even qualify them as needed. So for on create only when tags are created, run this, you can even run for a branch. So when there is a push only for a specific branch, or you can mention a regex as well, um, when it matches that. And then also you can, you know, schedule all of these with a cron. So you have a nightly build or, you know, a nightly linting for all of your code. Uh, you know, you can schedule that with a cron syntax. So like how I said, steps is where all the magic happens. Um, so, you know, you can run other actions. Okay, sorry, um, I guess my screen dropped off for, for a moment. I won't be covering more of the arguments in uh, detail, but I'll show you that in the demo. You can even use conditionals and expressions, uh, you know, so you can uh, say if, uh, if it's a fake, Um, yes, Karan, you are live now. Uh, are you able to hear us? Yes, yes. Can you share the screen, please? I think um, yeah, sure, something, something went wrong with StreamYard and it suddenly kicked me out. Okay. <laughs> that sounds uh, surprising. <laughs> yeah. All right. So adding uh, your screen to the stream. Yes. All right, Karan, you are live. All right. So uh, let's get started with the demo. Uh, you know, I don't want to push this out further. So. I'll show you a demo of how you can, uh, you know, get started with actions. Uh, the first thing is, if you want to check out some of the existing actions, you can visit the marketplace, uh, kitup.com slash marketplace and look for actions. Um, there are multiple actions that you can reuse. Um, so let's, let's jump in and, you know, let's spend more time in the demo right now with some of this basic understanding. 
So uh, the demo that I'm going to be showing you is a nice small 2048 um, uh, application. Uh, it's a simple HTML, CSS, JavaScript game. Uh, it's it's open source under the MIT license. Uh, and for this specific demo, I've uh, Dockerized uh, Dockerized it. So let's let's uh, jump into it. Um, so I'm gonna show this to you probably later on. Okay, so um, I have uh, a Kubernetes cluster that's already running and I'm gonna be showing you uh, this one on top of it. Uh, so right now I'm running it on Azure, uh, but you can uh, you can use it pretty much for any Kubernetes cluster, um, you know, anywhere. Um, so my cluster is called uh, GitHub Demo, and what I've done is I have already deployed a um, a version of this uh, 2048 Kim. Uh, you can see this is my repo where I am having my 2048 uh you know game um so let me show you uh so if i go into this um so in my services and ingresses uh there is a load balancer that i have added to the front end of my application called game-2048 uh and that is accessible through this external ip address so let's me let me open it up and you can see that you know here is here is my game that's uh, already running. So I did not show you the deployment of this because uh, that's something that, you know, Vivek covered in the previous session. So what I'm going to be showing is how do you uh, run your pipeline and how do you kind of continuously deploy? Yeah. So uh, before that, let me show you um, what uh, the YAML for this looks like. Uh, so let me connect to my code space. Um, so that I can show you what this looks like. So code spaces is one of um, you know one of the really cool uh, features on uh, GitHub, which helps you um, have a whole development environment by itself. Um, you know that is integrated with Visual Studio Code on on your browser editor. Uh, it all runs within a container on uh, you know on top of GitHub. So let me see if I can. Uh, improve this okay cool so what i'm gonna do is uh, let me just close this and then let me close uh, bring down the terminal okay so you can see i have my yaml file over here which is 2048.yaml and this is my uh, kubernetes configuration yeah so um so you can see that um Basically, what I've done is there are two objects of Kubernetes within the same file. One is a deployment um, for my application, and then one is a service. Um, so deployment is what actually runs these pods in the application, and service essentially helps me expose my deployment to the outside world so that you can access it. Uh, it doesn't have to be always exposed to the outside world, uh, but in this case, that's the that's how we're doing it. So you can see here, it's a, you know, a kind called deployment, which means it's a deployment object. The name of the deployment is 2048 app. Um, so the specification for this uh, deployment is uh, two replicas, uh, which means it's gonna run two pods. And uh, the deployment strategy is a rolling update. So, um, so basically that means that, excuse me, Excuse me. So whenever you create a new or update the deployment, how should uh, you know the strategy to update that should be? Um, so two of the most used strategies are rolling update. Uh, you know wherein uh, each of the pod uh, is brought down along with a new pod being created of the new version, and then you know that way all of the uh, you know pods within the deployment get up, uh, get updated. And the second one is recreate, uh, which basically means it recreates all of the pods. So in this case, we're saying rolling update. And uh, so there are you know, some configurations that you can add uh, for specifically rolling update, which basically is how many maximum new pods can be created uh, you know, at a time and uh, how many can be unavailable, et cetera. And uh, uh, here, uh, these are selectors, which basically says you know, what pods should be a part of this deployment. 
uh, and this is the pod definition itself, uh, which again basically says use this label called app two zero four eight. Um, and uh, within this pod, there's only one container, uh, which is called two zero four eight game. And this is uh, the image for this is on uh, my uh, GitHub account um, on GitHub Container Registry, uh, which is GHCR MV Current two zero four eight. And I am saying expose the container port of eighty. So this will have my deployment with two pods, and then um, also I have a service with a name, uh, a selector which says you know uh, what what pods should be exposed to this service. Um, and here I'm saying app two zero four eight, which is the same as what it is for my pod as well as my deployment because that's what I want to expose to the outside world. Uh, it's a type of load balancer. There are different types of services, but when you mention type load balancer, um, the underlying, uh, you know, if it's a cloud provider where you're running Kubernetes, uh, in this case, for example, Azure, um, will be creating a new load balancer and attaching that to the service. Um, so I'm just adding a name and HTTP, the, the, the port number of the service itself, you know, so in this case, you can think of it as the port number of the load balancer and the target port. So where should traffic coming to this service be redirected to on which port? You know, where we know because we're mentioning uh, the pods with app 2048, but which port? So we are saying uh, port 80 because that is what we are specifying for the container port as well for our specific application. So this is, you know, a simple, uh, you know, a manifest uh, Kubernetes manifest that has already been uh, deployed. So let me let me show you that um, using the uh, kubectl uh, command. So I'm gonna increase this font size. So um, like how you know Vivek mentioned at the previous session, kubectl uh, you know is the uh, command line client, um, kubectl, kubectl, however you want to call it as to interact with you know the api server of your kubernetes cluster so um, i like to usually create an alias just called k uh, because k for kubernetes k for current uh, and then use that so i'm just going to do a k get nodes and it's going to show me the nodes that is you know in this case the virtual machine so you can see i have two nodes which is uh, you know running as a part of my cluster so since i've already deployed this um, the demo which I'm going to be showing you is how to update this and ensure the pipeline runs. Yeah. So uh, if you're thinking that, hey, you know, why are you showing us already a deployed um, application? Don't worry. I'm going to be deploying it again through a pipeline and showing it here. So um, so let me show you that. So if I just do k get deploy, uh, it's going to show me all the deployments. So you can see that um, the deployment is 2048 app, the name which I mentioned over here. Um, and uh, both the replicas are ready and available and uh, it's been running for quite a while now. So let me um, also just see uh, services, k get SVC or service, etc. Uh, so you can see uh, the service called game-2048, which is what I defined over here, uh, you know, of type load balancer. And this is the IP cluster IP for the service that's within the cluster, it's accessible. And here is my external IP, you know, so this is the IP address of the load balancer that can be used to access the application. So uh, let me, let me copy this and uh, open up um, the application. So if I open up this, like how I said, I can see my application. Yeah. So, so let's, uh, you know, now take a look at our pipeline itself, our workflow slash workflows, and uh, it's a YAML file again. Yeah. So, so the jobs is where, uh, you know, there's going to be the pipeline that's going to be running. So let me collapse this and show you the jobs. So you can see there are two jobs over here, one called build, which builds a new container image based on the tag release, and one is called deploy. So let's take a look at what build does. So you can see the name is called build and it runs on Ubuntu hyphen latest. So, so a job is composed of steps like how I mentioned. So what are the steps to run this job? So just remember the build 
job will run in its own VM on Ubuntu. The deploy job also will run in its own VM, okay? But we would want the deploy job to run only after the build job is done, yeah? So we didn't want build and deploy to happen simultaneously. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll still end up deploying an older version of your application, right? So we'll see how that is accomplished. But right now, uh, the build job, the first thing is I'm checking out all the files. Um, it uses an action called checkout. And uh, by default, it checks out the files uh, within the same reference that triggered this workflow, okay? So re by reference, I mean um, all the files within the commit related to the tag, within the branch, within a pull request, within a commit, et cetera, right? So that is by default, but you can change the behavior. And here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm using a community built action. Uh, this is the name of it, where this action pushes the image, uh, it builds as well as pushes the image to my container registry on GitHub. So what I'm saying is uh, for it is with, is basically how you pass certain arguments to the action um, so I'm saying the name of my image is MV current slash 2048. The registry is GitHub container registry and the Docker file is Docker file here, which you can see within the root of my uh, repository. And then uh, remember I mentioned to you about secrets. Yeah. So where I say, this is the username for the registry and this is the password for the registry. Notice how I'm not mentioning my username and password over here. Um, so these are resolved through, um, uh, through context. Yeah. So here, uh, there is a context variable that's available within workflows called GitHub, and dot actor basically gives you the username of, um, whoever, uh, has triggered this workflow yeah, and where it's running. Um, and then the password is I'm using the secret store and then I'm mentioning, look for the um, name of the secret called pack, which is a uh, personal access token. So where you can find this within GitHub, if you go into settings for a repository, you can find uh, secrets here towards the left. So if I go into secrets, I can uh, have multiple secrets over here. Um, and that's where I have my pack. So I'm gonna go back again over here to my code space. So it's gonna use that and then push it and uh, have it on the container registry. So uh, let me, you know, open up my um, my uh, container registry. So if I go to my um, packages on my profile, um, I can see 2048 over here and uh, I can see the recent image versions and all of that. I pushed one image, you know, last night and uh, that's that's what's available on my uh, container registry, and we current slash 2048, yeah. So, and then once the build happens, we want the deploy job to run. Now, I haven't included test over here, but it would be very similar. So you can have um, in between build and the deploy job, you can have a test job. Uh, now just remember the order doesn't really matter in the, which how you kind of uh, write it down. Um, you can resolve the dependencies through something called needs, yeah. So this is how we are resolving the dependencies within jobs. So we have a deploy job and we say needs build. That means the build job should be completed before the deploy job starts, yeah? So, uh, and then this also runs on Ubuntu latest. Now just take a closer look at what's gonna happen with deploy. So the first is we are of course doing a checkout. This may not be the case always, but I'll tell you why we are doing a checkout. The second is we need to set the context from kubeconfig, uh, right? So, so basically what we're gonna be doing is we need to first establish a connection with our Kubernetes cluster, right? So um, there is an action, uh, you know, that uh, Azure has written, which is Azure slash K set context V1. Uh, now this is something that you can, you know, use for any Kubernetes cluster. Uh, basically what you have to do is there are multiple methods available of how you can set the context for interacting with the Kubernetes cluster later on. So one of them is called kubeconfig. For this, what you do is you, you just pass a kubeconfig file. Now, what is a kubeconfig file? Basically uh, has all the configuration options 
uh, for connecting to a certain Kubernetes cluster. So if I do kubectl config view, it will show me, you know, multiple things like uh, what is the cluster, what's the name of the cluster, where is the server available, what is the certificate authority, and all of this. Again, it's a basic YAML file. Yeah. So I have again added that to my secret store and mentioning that, and I'm mentioning that the context is GitHub hyphen demo, which is my Kubernetes cluster. So I set the context saying, okay, anything that I'm going to be mentioning about Kubernetes later on uh, should use this context. So next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the tag name. Yeah. So why do I need the tag name? Well, what I'm doing in this case is I'm getting the tag name of whatever triggered the pipeline deployment and use that as the same tag for my container. Yeah. So here you can see the tag is v3.1.2. Yeah. So if I do a new tag of say v3.2.0, I want my container image also to have the same tag. Yeah. So that is the reason why I'm getting that tag name through this again community action. Now I'm getting the new container uh, image tag. So basically I'm kind of like building that whole URL uh, very similar uh, to this. Uh, ghcr slash io slash blah 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 so that's what i'm building it over here uh, where i'm using something called as a set output um, which uh, gives an output uh, which can be referred later on so i'm saying ghcr.io slash mv current 2048 and git tag name so this is an environment variable git tag name that is set by the previous action over here yeah so then after that, finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy to Kubernetes. So again, I'm using one of the actions written by, uh, you know, Azure, where I'm mentioning that which is the manifest that I want to deploy. There can be multiple manifests that I can mention as well. And what is the images that has to be updated? So here I'm mentioning, uh, you know, uh, again, a variable, which basically means, okay, in the steps in this job, um, you know, there should be an ID of a step called image tag. You can see over here. And then uh, the output of that uh, step and with the name called image, you can see over here, right? So basically it gets that whole URL and says update this. Yeah. So that's what's going to happen when I run this um, workflow. Yeah. So there's a job, there's going to be a build that happens. It's going to be a deploy that happens um, and then it's going to run. Right, so let's let's do that right away. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do is uh, again, you don't have to, you know, necessarily use a code space itself. You can do it, you know, in any other way using your Git terminal or however you want. So this I'm gonna show it to you. For example, I'm just gonna go to index.html and I'm gonna just edit it right over here only. You know, you can do this anywhere that you want. So uh, you see there is a text over here called join the tiles and get to 2048. Yeah. So I'm just going to update this one, you know, very simple update uh, just to show you how the pipeline is going to run. So I'm going to say, um, just say, hope you are excited at OSS stays. Okay. A very simple update. I'm just changing that text, but it pretty much holds true for anything. Yeah. So, and then I'm going to directly commit it right over here to master. Um, so, okay. So you can see that this has been updated line 30. Um, so now let me go and check in actions. This wouldn't have triggered anything because remember we are triggering the workflow only through the push of a tag. It starts with V. Yeah. So let's go create that. So uh, what I like to do is usually I like to um, create a new release. So uh, just for reference, this is the tag. So I'm going to say create a new release. And um, I'm going to tag this as v3.2. Sorry, 3.2.2. Okay. And I'm going to say OSS days release. Okay. Just the name of the release. So it's going to create this tag with the target of master. Um, and then I can even attach the binaries that you want. It doesn't really matter. So, and I'm going to say publish the release. Yeah. So, um, so if I go back, you can see it's related to the commit that I just had pushed and let me go back to my actions right now. You can see there is a new workflow, which is running. So if I go and click on the name, 
um there is one uh in progress job and if i go and click on the left over here it's going to show me the steps these are the logs so the setup of the job is complete which means all the necessary actions have been pulled and then it has done a checkout of the files as well of getting everything and now it's what it's doing is it's building and pushing the docker images so you can see it's uh, you know it would it would be so all of this you know right now the build job would be running on a vm that runs ubuntu yeah so that's where all of this workflow uh, would be happening so let's uh, let's give it a few more seconds but meanwhile uh, it is meanwhile while it's running um, i'm going to show you what it's doing right now is this step you know build and push docker image within the workflow so it's taking a little longer uh, than usual um, so let's let's give it um, you know a few more seconds it should have been done by now so in in you know uh, i talked about the streaming logs as well so for example you know if there was something with the checkout what you can do is you can see the line numbers over here you can actually just right click and then you know a copy link address and then share it with your team um, you will get a deep link for the logs as well uh, which is going to link over back to that specific line so uh you can see over here um okay so it seemed like uh it is just this was not refreshing but here when i open it again i can see that both the jobs have run so um here i can see the build and push docker image also got completed um v3.2.0 so when i hit on refresh on my registry uh i am able to see v3.2.0 that was just published 2 minutes ago so also uh, the deploy job also has run you can see the green check marks over here which is all the steps that was part of a deploy job so checkout happened set context from cube config also was successful get tag name also was successful and then get new container image tag was successful and then you know deploy to kubernetes also was successful so you can see that uh, you know what happened when the deployment run so it did a uh, rollout status it gives you so uh, zero out of two new replicas have been updated one have been updated and then one is pending termination etc and then it said deployment successfully rolled out and it gives you the output of the service as well uh, you can verify this if you want even within your kubernetes uh, uh client that is kubectl and there are some annotations which are added as well so let me go back uh and then you know hit on refresh uh and then you can see that this has got deployed within my kubernetes cluster uh which is reflecting over here you know this is the ip address of the load balancer that i have um so if i go into uh k um get deploy um it's going to show me the deployments this is the name of the deploy so i'm going to say k describe deploy the name of the deployment which basically gives me all the details of the deployment you can see that the image it is running is v3.2.0 you know um and then you can see that uh just a few minutes ago there have been certain uh you know updates that has happened to this uh deployment so that's that's how you know you can use this is a very very simple example but even if you are you know using multiple uh containers or multiple manifest files you can use a very similar mechanism to uh to get your uh to get your deployment running so basically again what we did over here was uh we had a 2048 source we released a tag and then it ran an actions workflow um which uh was pushed to the github container registry it updated my 2048 app deployment uh which was again picked up by the game 2048 service which was exposed through a load balancer which we accessed yeah so all of this is what happened uh when that just one workflow file with a simple deployment so my final pro tips on you know how you can better use actions are 
Uh, you can use like how I said shell script on the runner shell. If you don't have any existing uh, action, you can just use a run and then you know install anything, set up anything. Remember that your VM would be running for that specific job as long as the job is not complete. So you, once you install any dependencies, you can reuse it later on within the same job. You can use default environment variables like how I mentioned GitHub Actor, GitHub Repository. There are multiple ones as well. You can even trigger workflows externally, you know, so something called as a repository dispatch. So, for example, if you do a post to slash repos slash your owner, that is, say, MV current for GitHub, which is the repo and then dispatches, you can even trigger, you know, a workflow from outside uh, through a webhook or, you know, just a post or however you want it. So that way you don't necessarily have to use always and only GitHub events. Like also, I have mentioned, you can use scheduled workflows with the cron syntax, and uh, you can resolve dependencies across jobs. Like how I showed you, we resolved a dependency between build and deploy, where we said deploy needs a build, and only then, uh, you know, deploy can run. You can even resolve multiple dependencies. Uh, I mentioned also about conditional, so you can run a job based on previous step exit status. If it was a failure, success, cancelled, always there are multiple conditionals that you can use. And you can use the built-in secret store as well, like how I showed you. Um, you can store pretty much most of the secrets out there that you want. Um, there is also, you know, uh, migrating to GitHub Actions and, you know, how you can use, uh, if you're using some of the existing CI tools, how you can, you know, use GitHub Actions along with it. Um, there is also a complete hands-on learning course. So if you go to lab.github.com, um, there is, um, you know, a learning path that we have called DevOps with GitHub Actions. And this is something that you do hands-on. So, uh, you know, we have uh, our own, uh, you know, GitHub training bot uh, that keeps on, you know, looking out for what you're doing. And, you know, so uh, you can interact using comments, pull requests, commits, etc. And it's going to help you learn through, uh, you know, a step-by-step uh, kind of a hand-holding process. You know, it's very cool. Um, you know, uh, most most of us, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, help contribute to these learning paths or use it ourselves to learn a lot of the things. So it's, uh, it's really awesome. Do check it out. And um, finally, I know I mentioned earlier, but um, you can run all of these actions even on your own hardware for free with self-hosted runners, you know. So by runners, I mean, you know, those specific uh, Docker images or, you know, however you want to deploy uh, or even say VMs on your own hardware, right? So there are means to do that. Do check it out in docs. It's a little out of scope for this session, so I won't be covering that. And then finally, it's free for public repositories. So, you know, you can use actions for various different, you know, pipelines or uh, various different automations, however you want, uh, you know, for public repositories. Um, also, uh, right now, like how I mentioned, there are more than 5,000 plus um, actions available on the GitHub Marketplace. And, you know, we're working very closely with, excuse me, various different, uh, you know, organizations, tools, etc., to uh, better integrate with GitHub Actions so that you get a more seamless workflow uh, working with your various other tools, um, you know, using GitHub Actions and are, you know, not limited by uh, any constraints. Um, so you can go check it out, know more on github.com slash features slash accents. And, you know, you can, you can get started, uh, get started uh, using it. So uh, that's, that's it, uh, you know, I had for uh, today. Uh, thanks a lot. And then, you know, you can, uh, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, etc. And uh, uh, we can take up any questions that we have coming up right now. Um, Akshay, I can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now, Karan? Yes. Yeah, Karan. So that was a very great session, and uh, it was, you know, very detailed and informative as well. Uh, so, uh, so guys, if you have any questions for Karan, like please drop them in the live chat so that we can get them answered live. Um, there is one question saying, please share the Git repo. So I hope uh, you can be doing that offline, Karan. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
just just go to my profile mv current slash two zero four eight, and uh, you can you can that's the repo. It's public. Awesome. So, do we have any other question for current guys? Uh, please drop them in the comment box so that I can ask current live and get it answered. Okay. So there is uh, one question. Uh, can GitHub Actions be used for code in uh, GitLab? Uh, so that depends on, you know, how you want to kind of like configure it. Um, so if you, if, so it, it's going to be a little complicated, you know, in terms of getting the code from, uh, you know, one repository to another repository and then checking it out and listening for the triggers in one place and other place, etc. But uh, Actions is very extensible. So, uh, you know, which means like how I mentioned, you can trigger from external uh, post requests, and then you know you can uh, even use something like a plain vanilla get checkout as well. Uh, you know, so when it uh, when you're using um, uh, something like that, uh, you can pretty much extend it however you want. Okay, uh, so uh, so we have one more question from the same guy uh, from Suman. Mm -hmm. Is GitHub Actions alternative to Jenkins? Um, See, I, I wouldn't call it as like an alternative replacement or so, uh, because Jenkins is a CI CD tool, whereas CI CD is one of the act, one of the use cases for uh, actions. Uh, you know, so you don't have to just uh, uh, you know set up your CI CD pipelines using actions. You can set up a lot of the automated workflows as well. You know, for example, uh, we have seen many of them use it for uh, you know say. I create a pull request, yeah, and there will be an action workflow that is going to run and check whether your pull request has any of the basic necessary requirements or not, and then add, say, uh, you know, comment or even approves it automatically, etc. You know, so all of those also you can write, you know, using GitHub Actions. It need not be just CI/CD. Okay, uh, awesome. So uh, we have. Uh, I'm just looking if we have any other questions. Uh, okay, so yeah. So, what all are the advantages of GitHub Actions over uh, Jenkins? Um, so a few things. Um, like, like how I said, you know, one is you can you can write your entire you know, automation workflows uh, with actions need not be just CI or CD. Uh, the second thing also is around, uh, you know, having everything within the same ecosystem. So you don't have to kind of like um, maintain multiple build servers or multiple Jenkins servers, etc. Uh, you know, this is something that can be managed on GitHub's uh, end itself, you know, so all you have to do is write a workflow file, um, you know, and the triggers, uh, etc. Uh, so there are there are multiple advantages of you know how you can use uh, GitHub Actions and you know in comparison to various others. So uh, there are there are a lot of you know articles and details out there on GitHub Docs as well as you know um, other uh, you know third party writers. You know I would encourage you to uh, go take a look at it. So we have one more question from Arvin. Sure. Can I have a trigger that have two push requests, which is dependent on other? Um, okay, I'm I'm a little confused because push requests and pull requests. Um, okay, so I'm gonna assume it's either a push or a pull request. Um, so you, it depends on you know your use case. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by depending on one other. So if you're saying that. If I, can you have a push uh, such that only if one push happens and then the other push also happens, something like that, or one pull request? Sorry, I don't understand. You know what is the use case over uh, here? But what I can say is, uh, you can definitely automate some of that as well. For example, you know you can have a um, uh, one of them. Okay, um, sorry, uh, I think Arvind has provided a clarification. I'm just looking, looking at that. 
uh, if you have defect one committed but which needs defect two uh then only my build request uh needs to be honored uh okay yes so definitely you know you can you can uh, you can set up something like this uh so there are there are again multiple ways uh, you know i don't want to dive deeper into solutions for uh you know specific use case but uh the guidance over here is one you can use a combination of triggers you know what specifically triggers the workflow and second you can also uh you know use uh um uh, you know something like uh, git refs or also uh, some part of your uh, diffs uh, and also patches if it's a pull request etc so you can use those as well within your workflow files to figure out uh, you know what exactly has happened or changed etc and based on that only uh, you know continue with your workflow awesome so i think the uh, arvind has got his question answered uh, we have one more uh, we have one question from pradeep mm -hmm. can we integrate with uh, jacoco and sonar and publish reports through a uh, mail um so to some extent yes uh, you know so i've seen many of them you know use it i believe there is a excuse me pardon me I, i'm so, uh, not sure if there is an already existing uh, action for uh, uh, you know sonar but even if it's not uh you can write always like a uh, shell script uh you know for this and then run it through the action workflow file it's well through the run command so that that's definitely possible all right so one more question from ravi shankar uh what is the advantage of using github actions over jenkins and other uh, ci tools uh in what this is an advantage for uh, organizations okay good question so um i think i've spoken enough of uh, you know github actions uh you know uh, over jenkins but i want to address you know the advantage for organizations is that um, say if you have an org account you know with multiple repos yeah and uh, one what is going to happen is that it will help you consolidate all of your um, you know uh, workflow runs in a single place uh it's going to help you give also an oversight in terms of you know what's happening with various different uh workflows and automations across different repositories uh and two what's going to happen is you can actually um you know build a lot of your uh shared knowledge uh within your organization using github actions i'll tell you how because all of this is workflow files right so uh, i've seen you know many of the organizations have a repo uh, only for workflow files right so if someone writes a new workflow for say you know a build or uh, a certain use case etc so they have it on that internal repo and uh, many of the other teams uh, with their own um, you know repos just use that workflow file to run all of those you know so it really helps you share a lot of that best practices around your ci cd pipelines uh, in within your version control system itself and also with the power of git by things like permissions etc within the org as well you know so think of it as um your pipelines very much closely integrated with um you know the version control system and all the other features of uh of git itself awesome so i think uh, you got your link question answered ravi uh so if you have some more time uh, like sure. uh, in the current let's answer a few more if, if that's fine um so we have one one question from prajwati can it be integrated with uh, jira workflows absolutely so in fact in one of the um in one of the uh, slides where i showed previously uh there is a, a pre existing action on the marketplace for uh, jira so you can just use that within your workflow file uh, for whatever is the use case that you're using it um so definitely you can awesome uh so we have uh, just you know one more question uh what is the github action plugin used to connect to uh jenkins um so i don't remember this at the top of my mind but i would definitely suggest you to go to the marketplace um github.com/marketplace and you know you can uh look for it over there um so just just search for jenkins and then you know you will be able to find 
All right. So with that, uh, we wrap our live Q&A. So Karan, um, I see that we have you know, several more questions coming in. So if you could just hop onto our YouTube stream and address them there, uh, or you know, take it offline. So that'll be great. And as usual, Karan, uh, it's a pleasure, you know, like having you with us, like sharing your knowledge with the community. Uh, great session, by the way, and uh, yeah, very th uh, like very detailed and thorough. So we hope to collaborate with you, uh, like in our future events as well. Great, um, you know, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, 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 Akshay, Confab team, uh, and everyone else, uh, you know, were here for uh, inviting me, uh, you know, for this. Uh, I hope the session has been, uh, you know, useful for you. Uh, I'm just, uh, um, you know, really excited to see if there are uh, some of the workflows that you would be writing or actions that you would be writing. Um, so just a final thing that I want to, you know, mention, uh, you know, I know some of you might have been asking this, you know, on uh, the chat. Um, GitHub Actions is complete for public repositories. Uh, for private repositories, there is, uh, you know, a certain cap uh, in terms of what we call as action minutes. Um, so action minutes is, you know, how long an act, um, how long an action workflow runs for. So there are certain limits if you want to do that on private repositories, uh, up to which it is free, and then you know, um, after that it is, uh, it is chargeable. It varies based on you know the type of uh, plan that you would be using. But for public repositories, um, you know, it's completely free. So uh, do check it out and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, see how you can, uh, you know, use GitHub Actions. Um, so I know there are a lot more questions coming in. I'm going to uh, now jump on onto the uh, um, YouTube channel with the any other questions that's going to come in and then address those. So thanks, everyone. Once again, stay safe and have a great day ahead. Yeah, you have a great day, Karan. See you. Thanks. All right, guys. So that was Karan uh, with this session. Hope uh, you all learned some uh, something from it, and it was a really detailed and well put session. Uh, so, okay, moving on. Uh, right now, uh, we have our game time. So let me just share my screen. All right, guys. So uh, we are announcing the quiz time for OSS Days Day Two. Uh, so the quiz starts at 1 p.m. and ends at 1:10 p.m. The top three winners will receive a cash prize of rupees 500 each, and we will be contacting the winners through email. So the quiz link is as mentioned here. I will also be uh, displaying it in the you know live chat and also on screen as well. So, uh, so these are the uh, like okay so okay so these are the game rules um there will be 10 multiple choice questions the top three scorers in the leaderboard will be considered as winners duplicate entries will not be entertained and will be disqualified and the organization uh, organizer decision is final so without uh, further ado uh, i think we can start with the quiz uh, so we will be opening the uh, link in a while and we'll be sharing it on screen as well and in the chat box below. Okay. So we are live with the quiz, guys. Uh, so this is the quiz link. Uh, it's also in the description below and on screen as well. So yeah, do flood in with your entries. Uh, really excited to see uh, how you how well you guys score. So let me sh uh, quickly show you the leaderboard. Uh, so this entry is me. Uh, so. I have entered a you know correct option count of 10 and I've taken a total time of 121 seconds. So I challenge you guys to you know beat my time of 121 to answer all the uh, you know questions correctly. So I will be refreshing this in intervals of every 30 seconds. And uh, yeah, let's see how many of you you know come up here.
So we have one entry, Sujay Shankar. The quiz will be closed like five to 10 minutes after the link has been opened. So guys, the link is being uh, uh, shown on screen as well as in the comments below, uh, also in the description. So uh, click on it, uh, it's, uh, it's free to play. Uh, you just need to register for over six days. So only registered participants will be allowed to play the quiz. Awesome, so we have three entries now and uh, it's Bala leading them. So congrats Bala. I want to see how many people can beat my score of 10 under 121 seconds. So yeah, game on. Okay, we have Vignesh are leading the pack now. Uh, so congrats Vignesh for leading the leaderboard for now. Uh, we have a couple more minutes to uh, uh, until we close the uh, form. So get going guys. Awesome, now we have Siddhartha who's come with the correct option count of seven. And followed by Raj Gopal and Vignesh. So nobody has still uh, beat my correct option count under the given time. Still waiting for that. Okay, so Suman has answered nine in 135. So we got, uh, we got 12 entries so far. So yeah, keep them coming in guys. We'll be closing the quiz uh, in a while. So uh, answer them while the link is still open. And the top three winners get a prize of rupees 500 each. Okay, we see a lot of the sevens. So we got 20 entries so far. All right, guys, so we have two more minutes until we close the quiz. Uh, hope you guys are able to see the uh, uh, link being uh, displayed on the stream as well and also in the comments box. So yeah, hurry up and stand a chance to win if it is 500. Let me refresh it once more. So the time is 12.58. We have a couple more minutes until we uh, close the quiz. Yeah. Come on, guys. Nobody, nobody can beat this. I thought it was easy. All right. So last minute of our quiz being open. Uh, we've been getting a lot of entries. So 36 entries so far, excluding mine.
Let me refresh it one more time. So just a few more seconds until we close the quiz, guys. So you keep your answers coming in. Awesome. We've got 41 entries. OK, so it's 1 PM, and we are closing the quiz. Let me refresh it one more time and then close it. Stop quiz. So guys, uh, so these are the uh, you know final list of winners. At number one, we have Suman. Number two, we have Tejaswini. And uh, at number three. So we will be reaching out uh, and contacting the winners by email. So make sure that uh, you guys have given the right email for us to contact you and reach out to so that uh, you know we can confirm the same and allocate the uh, prize money to you guys. All right, uh, so guys, uh, coming back. So we have a list of learning resources, uh, which you can access uh, through this link. I will also share the link here. So I'm also sharing the link on screen. You can access uh, our learning resources, uh, uh, you know, which are actually free and which can help you upskill and take your uh, career in the right path so uh, make sure you, you utilize them you know to benefit them uh, okay also we have the azure dev challenge uh, which can be uh, completed by uh, completing one of the learning paths uh, on this link so uh, you, you know to complete the Azure Dev Challenge, visit this link. Uh, complete either of uh, you, you know either one of the learning paths. Uh, share it on Twitter uh, along with your MS uh, badge and uh, you know profile uh, and the MS learning path. And you know stand a chance to win one of the Azure Hero badges, uh, which look really cool and uh, really uh, uh, you know really nice. So you know hurry up, guys! The last day. Uh, the last day to complete the challenge is by the end of this uh, end of the next month. So yeah, hurry up and send your submissions in and stand a chance to win one of the Azure Hero badges. Also, guys, uh, like Overseas Days wouldn't be the success uh, it was uh, without our community partners. So let me uh, you know, give a like, huge shout out to each and every one of them. So we have AI and ML Group. We have the Bangalore CNCF, we have Cloud Native Bangalore, we have Co Learning Launch, Codeplex Community, CyberSci, CyberSci Queens, we have Delscript, we have Docker Bangalore, we have Docker Pune, we have CloudNet Bangalore, we have Elastic. We also have Geek Community and Girl Script. Uh, also the Hypertest Community. We also have Indian Startups Bangalore, Infosec Girls, and Chava Meetup Bangalore. Mozilla India, Open Community. Uh, we are glad to partner with Pilates Bangalore and Pilates Chennai, uh, who's been a huge support us in all our events. Also the Python group. Also, a huge shout out to Redis Labs to partner uh, to agreeing to partner with us for OSS Days, and Script Foundation and Soda Foundation Technology Cafe Bangalore, who's also been uh, good supporters uh, with us for our uh, early events as well. Also, a huge shout out to the learning and streaming partner for OSS Days, Ajureka. Uh, these guys did a great job in helping us, uh, you know, reach out to the community for OSS Days, and a big shout out to them. And not to forget, uh, uh, OSS Days was sponsored by Microsoft Azure. So we're really thankful to Microsoft Azure for making OSS Days happen and making it the success it is. 
if you love the sessions at Oasis Days, uh, please make a tag on the social media and you can add us at Confirm or use the hashtag uh, Oasis Days in your social media post so that we can like, retweet, and share them. Also, guys, uh, if you do need a certificate of attendance, please uh, uh, drop them in the you know workshop uh, feedback link. The link is as, uh, like shown on screen and will also be present in the description below. Uh, so your feedback is really important for us as it can help us improve our future events and how we deliver content to you. Uh, so I will be dropping links in the description and also in the live chat as well. For uh, your uh, other daily dose of entertainment on you know tech conferences, you can uh, you can follow our YouTube channel or our Twitter handle. So we organize and uh, uh, we organize tech events and conferences uh, on a very frequent scale. So do follow us on Confab Tech on YouTube and on our Twitter handle to get uh, daily updates on the latest and best in you know tech conferences happening around you. So yeah, guys, like that's it. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in for both days of uh, OSS days. Uh, without you guys, uh, none of this would have been possible. And a huge, you know, shout out to all the community for helping us and you guys for making OSS days the success it was. So yeah, so this is Akshay from Confirm, and yeah, signing off with OSS days. You guys have a great day.